It's the good news. Is it not? We don't walk alone. We don't fight alone. We are not alone. Glory to God. Today's scripture, we're going to dig into the gospel of Luke. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me there. I know in the worship guide online, it says we're going to go through verse 12, uh, but we're actually just going to read verses 1 through 7. Together, we're going to dig into the word of God, Luke 2, excuse me, Luke 12, verses 4 through 7. Let's hear together the word of the Lord. I tell you, my friends, this is Jesus speaking, speaking to his disciples, speaking to you. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. This is God's word offered to us in its reading and its hearing. So we together give thanks, Lord God Almighty. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious God, what a gift it is to gather around your word and to join together with the people of God this morning, hearing from you. Lord, I pray in this space and time that you would open our eyes, that we would see our ears, that we would hear. Open our minds, we would come to know and understand your word, our hearts, that we would feel its power. And I ask, oh God, that you would open our hands, that we would offer grace to the world. Together we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I made a big life decision uh, a few months ago. You know, people make life decisions during COVID. Uh, I think that's just an operating procedure that we've all gone through. I made a life decision during COVID. I was going to start coaching Sam's flag football team. Now, this was a big decision for me because I had not coached Sam in anything. I had always left that to other uh, moms and dads. I felt that those were things that might not really fit for me and Sam. You know what I'm saying? For those of you that don't know, I have, I have a 16-year-old, a 15-year-old, and, a, and an 8-year-old. So that seven-year gap is real. And if you know anything about third child syndrome, like their lives are different. Okay, they just get drug around, and so Sam has not had the same sort of kind of intense Addy Aiden parenting that, uh, that, that Sam has gotten, but it's a justice issue, and justice motivates me, and so uh, I, I coached Aiden in everything. I coached Addy in what, uh, what I knew about, which did not include cheerleading, by the way, uh, but, uh, but since I coached Aiden in so much, I was going to coach Sam as well. So here's the deal. The last thing I coached for Aiden was tackle football in sixth grade. I know tackle football, and I know what sixth graders are capable of, and I had been coaching him for years, third grade on. And so whenever it came time to go back to eight-year-old flag I-9 football, I was ill-equipped. I showed up at the very first practice and thought that I was going to had my mind wrapped around coaching six, seven, eight-year-olds, and I showed up and found out this was an eight, nine, ten-year-old league. There's a drastic difference, evidently. And I showed up to practice, and, and the entire practice, I think, okay, I know Sam's capacity. We're not going to throw the ball. This is going to be a running league, and we're going to learn how to run and block. And I know in flag football, you got to teach the kids hand behind your back. Shuffle, 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 shuffle. The people on the camera at home are getting dizzy. And so then I spend the entire time, the entire practice coaching blocking and teaching the running backs that whenever the blocker shifts and the defender commits, you attack the opposite side. The whole practice. There was a problem. 
First play of the game. Now, mind you, practice and game, same day. We kind of consolidated it because, remember, third child syndrome. So consolidated it, practice, game. We show up, first play of the game, hand it off to my elite running back, and everybody goes out and blocks. Shuffle, 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 get in their way. Next thing you know, attack, big run. I had no clue what was about to take place. The referee at I-9 football pulls out a flag. A little eight-year-old football, they literally had a flag. Pulls out a flag, throws it on the ground. I'm like, for what? You know, I'm, <laughs> you know? This is a no-blocking league. I spent the entire practice teaching these kids that we're going to block, and this is how you block. This is all we're going to learn how to do. Block, 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 block. The kids get back into the huddle. They look at one another, and I could see it in their eyes. They think we have the dumbest coach in the history of coaches. They were right. Uh, And I had this humbling moment. I had to look them in the eye and say, It does not matter what I have told you. All that matters is what the referee thinks. He is the judge. And he is telling us that this is no blocking, so we cannot block. Now, the rest of the game, the parents on the sidelines, because they have seen me, their coach, teach their kids how to block, are yelling at the referee that they're not letting us block. But the entire game, I'm having to communicate to the kids. It doesn't matter what I think or you think. All that matters is the one who is the judge. I believe that if we're going to really get around Luke 12, 4 through 7, we first must establish who is the judge. Because that's what matters. In this text, Jesus is really clear. You got to be, you got to be clear on who is the judge. And once you get clear on that, then everything else falls into place. And so there's a couple of texts, a couple of scriptures that I want us to to point to that will help orient us around who the judge is. Now, we we say this in the Apostles' Creed, but we might not know why. Do do you know, uh, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, so on and so forth. And then it says, who is the judge of? of the living and the dead, the quick and the dead. That's part of our profession that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. But, but do we believe it? Do we operate in that way? Do we focus on it? I, I think so often we fail to see Jesus in that way. But let's see what Jesus himself says. In the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John chapter 5, there's a whole section of scripture, verse 22, all the way down through 30, but we're only going to read the first verse of it. If you want to see more kind of proof in the pudding about who Jesus says he is and, and how God has assigned the role of judge to him, then go home and read that entire section through verse 30, digest it and dig in. But in verse 22, we hear clearly Jesus saying, moreover, The father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. God, the father has entrusted all judgment to the son. Jesus is judge. And this is really important for us to to wrap our minds around as we turn to to Romans chapter 2. We hear Paul kind of lining this this articulate uh, 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 idea and concept from the beginning of his his treatise in Romans. Chapter 1 talks about how we're all sinners and points points to sin as being a universal reality. And and in fact, he even lays it out so clearly. He's giving a big laundry list of sin, and then in the middle of it, he says, and and, and you'll become inventors of sin, which is his way of saying, I'm going to give a long list, but if I've forgotten something, I promise you're there too. And so here, Paul then turns in chapter 2 to point for us to what is critical, who is the judge. In verse 16, in verse 16, we hear it this way. This will take place, this judgment will take place on the day 
when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as the gospel declares. This is a moment where we're confronted with the, with the reality that, that our understanding of the Trinity ends up bifurcating God into these three persons, uh, and we, we all too often fail to see the unity of the Trinity, that they are three in one. And so Jesus is the judge. This is done through Jesus, but it is never done in opposition to the Father. God has entrusted Jesus to this task because he knows that Jesus does nothing without the Father, as he says over and over again in Scripture. Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the judge, and so whenever we come around that, we can orient ourselves uh, in, in a new way. I know it's a difficult task because this might not be your favorite or my favorite portrayal of Jesus. If I was going to sit back and just say, hey, people of God, here on February 28th, 2021, what's your favorite portrayal of Jesus? Someone would raise their hand and say, I love Christmas. Christmas is great. I love baby Jesus. Baby Jesus is my favorite portrayal of Jesus. He's in the manger. It's really sweet. There's animals all around. Uh, innocence. God made flesh. We get into that theology. Incarnation. Love it. Baby Jesus, number one. Ding, ding, ding. Everybody's like, yeah, I mean, that's a good answer. I like your answer. And then someone else would, would raise their hand and they would say, I love any image and portrayal of Jesus where he is loving all. Oh, I like that too. That's great. There's that moment where he's loving Zacchaeus, even though Zacchaeus is a sinner and he's eating with sinners. That's great. I love, I love how Jesus loves the unclean. Whenever the lepers are, are, are needing healing, he heals them and then he's close with them. He even heals the blind and touches them. All of that. I love that portrayal of Jesus. I love Jesus that loves all. It's beautiful. And I do too. We all do. And that's a part of his character. Maybe a critical, essential part of his character. And yet, we wouldn't say judge, would we? Then someone would kind of bashfully raise their hand, maybe kind of at half, and say, I love the image of Jesus as all sacrificing. There's just something about that Good Friday image of Jesus at the cross, knowing that he would sacrifice his life for me, that he didn't hold anything back, that there was no reservation or hesitation, but he would give his life for me, the image of Jesus on the cross. That's beautiful. But if I were to ask, what is your favorite portrayal of Jesus, how many of you would raise your hand and say, it's Jesus on the judgment seat. It's Jesus, Matthew 25, in his own words where Jesus says in the final day, on that judgment day, all the people will be gathered and I, Jesus, the judge, will separate them, divide them, sheep from goats and, and the sheep who have, done, who, who, who have done the work that I have sent them to, to that, have, that have loved me and loved others, loved God and loved neighbor, they will be ushered into eternity in heaven. And from that judgment seat, Jesus then says, and then there will be goats. There will be those that denied me, those that denied love to neighbor and to me, and they will be entering into an eternity in hell. I don't know if that would resonate as the number one, like that's, that's the image that I choose for Jesus. And yet, all four and more are Jesus. He is incarnate. He is a lover of all humanity. He has sacrificed his life for you and for me, and he is eternal judge. And so for us, we need to place him in that, in that rightful seat uh, as, as judge of all eternity, as judge over you and of me, and, and from that humble position then uh, saying that I'm not judge and you're not judge, but Jesus is judge. Thanks be to God for that. That's, that's where we could place him. And then we could come back to Luke chapter 12 
And in that passage, we could appropriately place Jesus in his own words and hear again what it has to say. There's a key word in Luke 12, 4 through 7 that we need to to walk through because it's used in three different ways. Same word. The word is fear. Now, this is a a Lenten season on reverence and and reviving reverence within us. And reverence, as we talked about last week, can look like awe and it can look like worship. Uh, And there are many other ways that reverence kind of can can be used and, and is a tool that we must have revived within us so that we can relate to God faithfully and appropriately. But one of the ways that reverence shows up in Scripture is through fear. Now, fear for us is, is something that, that uh, we have associated with some mm, neurotic tendencies that we have. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of bugs, roaches. They're gross. I'm afraid of rodents, any rodent. I don't care if it's a pet or not. It's gross, right? Like we, we start thinking about what are you afraid of? I'm afraid of my pipes busting. I'm neurotic about it, right? I wake up every hour. I turn my faucets a little harder. I spent $2,000 on a water bill, but I was afraid, right? So we have these neurotic tendencies around fear, and we think that it looks a certain way, shape, or form. But, but fear is so much more than those tendencies. We think that fear requires a fleeing from, a running from, or a reorganizing our lives in, in, in odd sort of ways. And yet fear is associated in Luke 12 for us with authority. Luke 12 associates fear with authority. So the first way that that Jesus uses this, he says, don't be afraid of, don't be afraid of anyone or anything that has no control over eternity. He says, look, there there are people or things that can uh, kill you, that you could die from. And that sort of fear is, is false. It's worthless. It has no... No meaning. And some of us are like, come on, Jesus. Like, it's good for me to be afraid of heights. Appropriately so. Like, if you climb up in a tree, at a certain point, you should get a little bit afraid and realize, I shouldn't climb any higher, right? Uh, If if you're walking on a ledge, you should say, I need to not go any further because death could be on the other side. There's appropriate levels of boundaries there. But Jesus says, hold on. You spend, you, people of God, spend so much time worrying about those things that have power here and now on this side of eternity that you fail to appropriate holy fear and understanding of authority when it comes to eternity. You, we, are preoccupied with the mortal realm such that we have no appropriate fear for eternity. So he says that. Jesus says in verse 4, don't be afraid of those that can kill the body because after your body is dead, they have no more authority. They can literally do no more. But then it turns, it turns, it turns in verse five. It says, but I will show you who you should fear. Let me tell you who you should fear. And it it talks about it at the front end and in the back end. It says, fear him who, after the body has been killed, has authority to throw you into heaven, into hell. Yes, fear him. You, we are to fear the eternal judge that has power over heaven and hell. We should appropriate that authority and have such reverence for it that it it leads us to a holy fear, a respect for authority. And I'm talking about a shift in in, in the framework that we operate in. I want you to think about when you first got your driver's license. Okay, and I'm not talking about your permit when your parent was still in the passenger seat. I'm talking about when you like left, you know, the first time you cranked it up and you see a cop 
And you've been breaking every rule. They told you not to roll through stop signs. Now you're free. You're rolling them stop signs. They told you not to speed, right? Now you're going eh, six, seven over because, right, it doesn't matter. But the first time you see the cop, what do you do? You respect their authority and you slow it down. You slow it down out of fear that you would get a ticket. Well, then because you're cheap and because you're worried your mom and dad are going to whoop you and you're worried what insurance is going to do. No, never mind. When you're 16, you don't even realize that insurance is appropriated based off of your driving record. Foolish children, right? But then something changes later on down the line. You had this, this fear of authority when it was in front of you. Then, then you get a little older, a little more seasoned, and you just start obeying the rules because you realize cops can hide really well, and it frustrates you, right? You're used to driving from Missouri City to, to Wharton, and you go through Kendleton, and it's a speed trap. Kendleton literally grows their grass taller than cars so that police can hide in the grass, and they're going to tag you every time. And you realize police can hide, and I'm not going to see them all. And so since I respect the authority of the police, I'm going to just drive more responsibly. Plus, is it really worth it to roll the stop signs? Just stop. If my 16-year-old self could hear my 40-year-old self, I don't think that conversation would really work. But then something changes, or so I'm told, where you don't just obey the authority because you're afraid of the penalty. You start to obey the authority because you realize they're the authority and the rules are there for a reason. There's something about their authority that has responsibility woven into it. And there are reasons for the decisions. And the authority is not mine and not yours for a reason. It's interesting when that shift takes place. So I, I would put before you that when Jesus says the one we are to fear is the one that controls eternity. The one who is judge over eternity. It's, it's interesting. Jesus is saying it and he's literally saying to his disciples, fear me. Did you put that together yet? Jesus is saying, fear me. Now, that requires us to, to shift out of the fear equals trembling, fleeing, running, hiding, shrieking, and now it looks like respect and authority and, and, and honor. It's a totally different paradigm. And so then Jesus wants to be sure we get the posture with which he holds his authority. He wants us to be fear-filled, but to know, but to know that we are not forgotten. The scripture turns in verse 6 and in verse 7 again. So first, don't fear anyone that has control over today, this, this side of eternity. But, number two, fear me. Fear me as judge who has authority over eternity. And then, number three, this third turn of fear. He lines out this image for us. And it's connected together, woven together with great intentionality. Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? He's saying this is a creature of infinitesimal value. It's so negligible. Who really cares, right? When was the last time you, you, you just left the couple of pennies on the counter? You literally thought that your time waiting on the pennies to be drawn out of, uh, of, the, of the drawer wasn't worth it. So you left and left the penny. These two pennies are worth five birds. And then, and then Jesus says, yet, in the second half of verse 6, yet, not one of them 
is forgotten by God. None of them are forgotten by God. And then it, 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 it kind of comes back in this huge sweeping image and says, uh, and, and indeed the very hairs on your head are numbered. God knows that exact number. Now, some of us are wondering, how is that possible? Because every time I vacuum, I realize I'm losing hair. And every time I take a shower, I realize I'm losing hair. So the number of hairs on my head are changing all the time. Yet God knows me so intimately that he knows every single number of my hairs. God knows me that well that I can definitively say I have not been, am not forgotten. So Jesus says to you and to me, be fear filled, but know that you are not forgotten. What is it like to know you're not forgotten? One of the things Jason and Molly didn't say in this shortened version of the video, by the way, there will be a longer version that will be released as well. One of the things they didn't say in this shortened version is that the back of that t-shirt became Jason's mantra. And the back of the shirt says, we don't kick field goals. And it's because the the, the Sunday after he had uh, been confronted with that diagnosis, after he and Molly and I talked about how he was just going to put the word out because he wanted every prayer warrior possible on, uh, on assignment to be praying for him and lifting him up. He wanted everybody to know so that they could come around him and support him and journey with him in this. He understood that. And so he shared with his, with his group that Sunday morning that we don't kick field goals. We're going for the touchdown. We're not going halfway. We're not going partway. We're not, we're not going to uh, try to wait and see. We're going to attack this and we're going to score. It is the fourth quarter. We're down by six and we're going to score a touchdown. We do not kick field goals. Jason had the attitude that we might not even kick extra points. That was just how Jason was built in this season. But with that attitude, he knew because of the love that he experienced from the people of God that he wasn't forgotten. He wasn't alone. He didn't fight alone. And he was not victorious alone. You were with him. Jesus was with him. He was not forgotten. What is it like for you and for me to have that intimate and intense knowledge of God's persistent and perpetual love that he has not forgotten you and yet acknowledge and respect his authority such that we are fear filled Jesus places those two things in balance So that we would know him as loving Savior. And we would know him as authority over heaven and earth. So let us be reverent in spirit. Reverent to the point even of godly, holy fear. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, what what a gift it is to come around your word and be confronted with truth. Truth that allows us to acknowledge that we are not God. You are. That we are not judge. You have given that authority to your son, Jesus Christ. And so we call upon his name. Lord, we call upon the name of your son, Jesus. We profess our faith openly. We profess you as Lord and Savior, and in so doing, we rely on your Holy Spirit to guide us each and every step of the way. Lord, we love you. 
We turn to you with our whole hearts and our whole lives. So that on that great coming home day, we would hear from our Lord and Savior. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into my heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.